Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a, another uh, Streaming Video Alliance webinar. Uh, this one is titled Reducing Stream Latency, and we've got a really awesome panel of people who are ready uh, to talk about this exciting topic. Obviously, it's top of mind for uh, a lot of video distributors and broadcasters out there, network operators, and we've got a stellar panel of technologists and uh, you know, and engineers and, and developers and operators to sort of dig into this topic and figure out, you know, what are some of the best practices to help reduce stream latency. Now, this webinar, as I said, is brought to you by the Streaming Video Alliance. Uh, if you're not aware of what we are, we are a uh, standards definitions organization, uh, much like SMPT or ITF, uh, that's trying to build uh, best practices, guidelines, specifications, and other things to help video distributors for streaming content around the world deliver the best possible viewer experience. And you can visit us on the web at streamingvideoalliance.org. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we, we, we are recording this video, so we will post it on the Streaming Video Alliance website and YouTube uh, probably a little bit later this afternoon. Um, your colleagues, then you can distribute that around and then whoever, you know, if you have somebody you know that wasn't able to attend but registered, uh, they'll get a link to view that as well. Uh, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to jump into some introductions. Uh, once we're done with those introductions, we will uh, move into some questions we have. We will try to, at the end of the webinar, leave about 10 minutes for any audience questions. Just remember that if you do have a question, you can pose it in the question box, uh, and we will try to get that answered by the most appropriate person. If we don't get to your question before the end of the webinar, we will try and do that via email. All right, so let's get started. Just me, I'm Jason Tebow, the Executive Director of the Streaming Video Alliance. Uh, and then what we're gonna do with introductions is we're just gonna go down uh, the row alphabetically by company. So let's start out with Kevin Johns from CenturyLink. Yeah, hi everyone, this is Kevin Johns. I'm with CenturyLink. Uh, I have responsibility for the uh, CenturyLink CDN architecture. Um, and I also co-chair VA uh, live streaming working group, which currently has some uh, uh, work focused on uh, kind of understanding within the OTT environment, uh, what some of the technologies that are available to help reduce that, uh, as well as how you can use existing technologies to try and reduce your uh, latency associated with your stream. So looking forward to talking more about that with everybody. Uh, back to you, JT. Thank you, Kevin. Now we'll move on to Chris. Yeah, <clears throat> Chris Samori with Charter Communications, a cloud video architecture team. Um, so mostly IP video architecture between live, VOD, uh, et cetera. Um, been in the industry for, well, I've been in the cable industry as a vendor and an operator for nearly 20 years. Um, and a good 12, 13 of those past years have been specifically around IP and ABR streaming. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Our next person is Johan. Yes, uh, good evening or good morning, everyone. This is Johan Bolin. I'm Chief Product and Technology Officer at Edgeware. Um, the Edgeware, we develop uh, CDM products, uh, streaming servers, and origin packager and subtitling solutions for broadcasters and uh, telcos and cable uh, operators. Fantastic. Thank you, Johan. Next, we have Patrick from Harmonic. Good morning, good afternoon. I'm Patrick Gendron. I'm Innovation Director at Harmonic. I'm French and based in French. I'm sure you would have uh, discovered that very quickly. Uh, I've been in this industry for more than 25 years now. Uh, to uh, give a short presentation of Harmonic, so we are a comprehensive portfolio of video infrastructure products and services. And the main focus for the video business today is uh, innovation, growth, and in internet delivery for live and scalability uh, issues. Thank you, Patrick. And next we have Fritz from Limelight. Hi, Fritz Sykes, uh, Principal Architect with Limelight Networks, focused on the platform and infrastructure as it pertains to delivery uh, and video. Prior to that, uh, I spent a lot of years inside of uh, MLB Advanced Media, which then uh, uh, spun off into Bantech Media, which was then acquired by Disney and is now known as Disney Streaming Services. Awesome. Thanks, Fritz. And last we have Richard. Are you there, Richard? 
I am. Thank you. All right. Well, sorry about that. There you go. That's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the, uh, the, the intro. Uh, my name is Richard Ostriker. I'm the CEO of Streaming Global. Uh, I've been in this industry for about 35 years, started in the cable, uh, moved into building technologies and then technology companies, um, always in digital media and uh, specifically in streaming uh, about 25, 27 years ago when streaming began uh, while I was still at Microsoft. Um, and that's it for me. Great. Thanks, Richard. All right. So let's jump into our first question. And uh, Johan, I'm going to pick on you first uh, to start off the discussion. But I think before we talk about latency and reducing latency, we need to define what latency is. Um, what isn't it? And, you know, should the industry be focusing on, you know, call it glass to glass uh, or, you know, maybe something like cash to glass? What do you think, Johan? <laughs> well, I mean, from the user's perspective or from the viewer's perspective, I assume there's only one kind of latency and that, that to me must be the glass to glass. So, so uh, uh, I, uh, I think that's what we need to focus on. And, and while we as Edgeware only can address, if you will, the last mile or the last couple of miles uh, of that, I think together we need to look at, uh, at the entire chain. Great. What about anybody else? Any thoughts on defining latency? I mean, you know, obviously the guys at the operator networks, like you know, you know, Fritz at, at Limelight and and Chris at Charter and Kevin at CenturyLink. What do you guys think of latency when when you think of a definition? Uh, this is Chris. Well, I, for me, I, I think uh, I think it definitely needs to be more than just cash to glass. Um, however, there's a lot of the there's a lot that goes into glass to glass, and there's a lot that's outside of our control, kind of along the same lines. Um, so, from our perspective, it's kind of from when we acquire or when we start processing content to glass, and, and kind of looking at the things we can affect in that chain to to reduce that time. Um, but yeah, it's it, it, I think it's it's a fuzzy topic there, and it can have different definitions. This is uh, Richard from Streaming Global, and I, I have to agree with uh, both of those panelists. I think that this is a, it's clearly, you know, from the moment the action happens, whether that's on set, on field, or on location, until each viewer sees that action on their screen, that's latency. Um, that part of it, to me, is clear. So glass to glass is probably the closest definition I've heard of that. Um, but I think the solution is going to come from uh, multiple components of the delivery uh, pipeline working together in different ways. Um, obviously, Streaming Global is not an infrastructure provider, but we affect the kind of processing that might need to be done uh, through the things we do earlier in the pipeline or later in the pipeline uh, to help improve uh, what the, the CDN uh can push without having to uh, slow their steps down. And just to add, sorry, this is Chris again. Just to add back to that, um, I, I think one of the things we need to pay attention to through this conversation is um, not to only focus, I think it's kind of along the same lines, not to only focus on the CDN or the transport, um, because I, I do think there are larger gains to be made through other pieces in the puzzle. Yeah, this is Fritz with Limelight. I, I think to to add to that, the you know if you're if you're talking about a live event and you look at it from an end to end from from acquisition or or creation of the content itself, you know for instance, photons hitting a CMOS sensor on a camera, the camera doing that actual processing, then the camera packaging it up, sending that feed to some kind of facility either on site. If again, if you're talking about some kind of live event like a baseball game within the stadium. Uh, it goes through a media workflow process, then that maybe goes to another location. It does some kind of segmenting in that packaging, maybe some ad injection, so forth and so on, uh, to the point where it's actually at the egress vector of the content origination, which will normally go into to a CDN. So, yeah, I think they're two sides of the same coin. There's cash to glass, which is certainly where transport, network, and um, you know, caching come into play, but prior to that you know prior to hitting uh, a cdn edge and traversing through that cdn network to the end user uh, there really is this orchestration about shaving milliseconds down 
uh, from, a, from a latency standpoint when you talk about the actual creation of the content. I think the other point behind that as well is that when we talk about latency, there, I think there needs to be a notion of uh, a, a you know speed of light is still a problem right so if if there is a, a an event that's being originated from somewhere let's say phoenix and it's being played out in new york city or it's being played out in singapore just by the very nature of, of electrons and photons and, and physics there's going to be some inherent latency so there's some understanding that i think needs to be had is when you talk about latency it isn't uniform. The latency for a globally converged event would be somewhat different depending on where the content is being originated and where it is being viewed. That's a that's a really good point. Um, you know, and, and I think it it it, it 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 should make us pause, right? It should make everyone in the industry pause to think about well, what are the components in in my entire workflow that might be adding to the latency of my streaming experience that are not just delivery. So I think that's very important, but I do want to focus on delivery for just a little bit. Um, you know, obviously, you know, caching is something that uh, all the operators are looking at, right? The CDNs are, are sort of masters of it. Even content owners, you know, will put reverse proxies and things in front of origins to help uh, mitigate, uh, you know, again, sort of that latency. Having things uh, available as close to the end user, you know, is great. But, and I want to pick on Kevin, uh, we'll start off with Kevin uh, for this one, but, you know, sort of what happens, um, you know, obviously in sort of that round trip um, scenario when uh, there's a cache miss, you know, what can be done um, potentially to improve caching efficiency and then obviously when there's a cache miss to sort of fetch content from the origin? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a bit of... Uh, probably per CDN operator uh, intellectual property that goes into trying to make the systems as performant as they can. But there's some basic techniques that can be used to try and move the content uh, between the, the network nodes as quickly as you can. One of the big ones is connection reuse. Uh, so instead of making a, you know, establishing a TCP session upstream, asking for the content, getting it, and then closing that session, you wanna hold that session open so that the next request that goes to that upstream doesn't have to bear the overhead of the TCP session establishment. The other thing that, that you know, a lot of us do is we do a lot of work on optimizing the TCP configuration, not so much the implementation, but making sure that windows are open wide uh, received buffers are, are well allocated so that we can get the content from point A to point B with as few acts as we need uh, to minimize the overhead with uh, round trip acknowledgements with the delivery of that data and get it into the receiver as fast as we can into their buffer locally uh, without having them to take it out of the buffer and put it into the application. So those are key techniques that, that we want to use to try and get that content throughout the system. Now, when you're talking about live, the other, they may be asking for pieces of information that may not quite be ready yet. Um, or that's one person asking for that piece of content that's been missed. Uh, and as it traverses up, you don't want to be, um, you know, continuing to ask for the same piece of content while it's being uh, served into the local cache. So you want to be able to do things like join that in progress uh, distribution so that if somebody comes a, a half a second later asking for the same object, you don't want to go up and fill it again because it hasn't persisted to cache yet. You just say, hey, here's what I have so far uh, that's been persisted to cache based on a previous request. And as I get the rest of it, I'll spool it out to you at the same time. And it brings everybody kind of up to that same time level within the distribution chain. That's great. Um, Fritz, you know, obviously from the CDN perspective, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, well, it, it's, you know, there, there's somewhat of a, of a science behind it. And, you know, the formula and the, the parameters are somewhat the same, depending on, <clears throat> regardless of, you know, which CDN or which infrastructure, which network. And I think it was, it was just laid out pretty eloquently. But there's, there's also, I think, a few more pieces to it um, outside of the mechanics. There's, you know, we're, we're seeing, uh, for instance, uh, we're starting to see more of an appetite for a push model versus a traditional 
pool model. So when you think about something like a cache miss where a CDN, a node within a CDN has to go back to an origin, fetch the content and persist it and serve it out, um, you know, there there seems to be a growing appetite for from a customer standpoint or for a con content origination standpoint to say, I don't want you to pull this content to me. I'm going to push this content to you. Uh, and there, there's a certain amount of, I think, uh, inherent durability in that to avoid cache misses uh, wherever possible. Uh, there, there's always some circumstances where cache miss, regardless of push or pull, is going to occur. Uh, but for the most part, with the content origination preempting us and saying, here is the content while we're creating manifests or while we're creating playlists, and I'm going to preposition this within your infrastructure itself. Uh, it, it seems to help overall in reducing the amount of cache misses that we see. Uh, and then in the traditional pool model, it's just geographic as well, right? You know, there, there is the distance uh, equation that needs to be considered. So, you know, the closer you can have your origin from a geolocation standpoint uh, to, say, an ingress pop vector for any of your given CDNs, it will also just help to reduce the potential latency of an actual cache miss itself. So just basic mechanics, but you sort of have to construct all of these together in an orchestration to get that total solution, that total benefit. Oh, that makes sense. Anybody else want to add to that? I mean, Chris, you know, you obviously might have some opinions about this as well, I would assume. Uh, sure. And, you know, we, we're all in unique circumstances. I'm you know, currently not streaming globally. So streaming to someplace like Singapore, Singapore uh, has less, an effect, less effect on things that I'm doing. Um, However, I think we, to, to me, I think the amount of savings we get within a CDN, especially across a given country or, or, or within a region, um, is somewhat minimal to the overall uh, question that we just answered just a second ago, which is the gold glass to glass equation. So whether we're talking about a difference of 10 milliseconds uh, or, or saving 100 milliseconds through a CDN, I think is less important than the overall um, equation and, and how much time are we spending in processing, how much time are, is, is the client spending in um, <clears throat> buffering locally. I think some of those can actually be a bigger uh, hurdle for us to, to cross. Um, but that being said, yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, any savings is, is, is fantastic <laughs> uh, and we're looking for it. Um, but I think the other thing that, that matters in this equation is uh, the, the, the level of interest within a given set of content. In other words, if you have, uh, if you're a, a broadcaster and you've got five, ten channels or, or services, there's a high likelihood that all of them have some level of interest. However, if, you know, they're... Uh, a legacy operator who has many, many channels and potentially thousands of channels, there may be some that don't have any interest at all. So um, paying attention to what needs to be pushed versus pulled if we go into that model matters and, and organizing those thoughts. And I make total sense. With streaming global, uh, if you don't mind me following up on what Chris said, I think he's, I think he's right on on looking at the different pieces and how the data is being uh, delayed, not just, and, and also uh, what was said earlier by Kevin about um, uh, which part of it is transport and not. Um, CDNs obviously play a, a critical role here for internet scalability, and uh, they have since their invention. Um, but there are tests of, similar to what Chris just mentioned have shown that um, the processing, ingest processing, transcoding, there's a lot of really costly, both money and time, steps involved in the conventional streaming pipeline, whether it's live or on demand. Obviously, live is uh, more processor-centric conventionally um, than, than, than on demand being more of a, a file download issue. Uh, but we found that uh, just by adjusting what are those steps, we can have pretty massive impact on the overall latency uh, that is still very much CDN friendly, uh, network topology friendly, and, and even potentially avoid a lot of the hoops that we see the industry jumping through to try and get these very small savings, whether it's a new protocol or it's um, obviously efficient engineering is, is a good thing to have. So I think the things that Kevin mentioned about optimizing um, Networking is, is critical as well, but there are some 
some things that we found that were uh, low hanging fruit for lack of a better term um, that could just be eliminated from the pipeline to significantly improve latency. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And so, you know, but one of the things you guys talked about before was obviously, you know, latency is not just about delivery. Um, and, you know, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is something maybe that's way earlier on in, in the workflow and how that impacts delivery and that's encoding. And, and obviously, I'm going to pick on Patrick uh, to start this discussion, uh, you know, given the fact that Harmonic is in the encoding business. Um, but, you know, Patrick, you know, can can choices be made during encoding that reduce or add to latency? You know, and, and if you can talk about it a little bit, what what you know are some of the best practices regarding like things like chunk size and profile variables that you could tell somebody to to make sure they use in order to maximize um, you know the encoding processing and time to encode so that it doesn't add to or contribute to latency. Yeah, for sure. So live encoding is um, uh, always a, a matter of compromise. Uh, you need to compromise between quality, bitrate, and latency. If you have more time, you can, for the same bitrate, bring the better quality, and uh, all those three parameters can be moved around. Uh, so uh, having that in mind, there are many uh, options uh, in the codec to box uh, to uh, reduce the latency from time for the price of some quality or bitrate increase. You can reduce the uh, preprocessing that you make on the on the encoder to this is to all this, all, all what you are doing to better characterize the video to better encode it later. If you make some simpler uh, preprocessing, you can reduce the latency. You can uh, reduce the look ahead. You can work on the box structure uh, to, to make, uh, to remove or have less D frames. All this can reduce the latency, but everybody has to keep in mind that this can have a price on the on the bitrate and or on the quality uh, which, is, which is delivered. So to, uh, to 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 get a good compromise, what you need to figure out is uh, what is the target latency that you need to achieve. Are you did you want to have the same latency as a traditional broadcast delivery? So this, I think all this picture in mind, this can guide you to, uh, to the proper uh, settings that you need to, uh, to set on your encoder. Uh, so this is for the, let's say, encoding core. Then uh, a second part of, uh, of your question was about the um, uh, segment uh, duration. For sure, we know that traditional delivery uh, you have, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a direct link between uh, segment duration and end-to-end -end latency, moving from HLS 10 seconds to uh, uh, HLS 2 seconds, you know that you will have a, a latency that will be reduced. Uh, so, uh, and, and this, uh, when it, it will come, probably we will talk later about that, when we go to new and absent uh, scheme uh, using chunk inside segment. Uh, this direct uh, link is not anymore uh, uh, active, but I, I think it's a good practice to have, to have in mind that if you want to reduce latency, you need to uh, reduce uh, segment uh, duration. Today, what we have as a team that the industry uh, goes to a kind of compromise between the VQ and the, and the latency, we tend to agree that a, a two-second segment duration becomes something that we we, we see more more and more. Uh, even if this uh, this two-second segment duration can be uh, discussed again when it comes uh, to uh, chunk-based delivery, but probably we'll talk about that later. Anybody have anything to add to that? You know, any experiences they've had with, you know, making encoding changes that have a material impact on latency? Uh, yeah, this is Chris again. I, I couldn't agree more with almost everything that Patrick said. Um, you know, the one thing we always need to keep in mind is is quality versus speed, um, and, and we need to find the right balance. It's the there there is that compromise, and it's all about finding the right balance. Um, 
I would say from practice standpoint and, and from what he said in the labs and various tests we've done across different places, um, two second segments have been a huge um, a huge win and, and actually seem to be uh, approaching that sweet spot without having to take those next jumps to, you know, changes in protocols and, and, and affecting client side and, 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 other, and the chunk delivery and all that kind of stuff. Um, that seems to be the current sweet spot. I'm not saying that'll be there forever, but that's, that's where it is. Um, uh, at, at least from our tests. So I, I, I think that almost everything that Patrick said is, is, is spot on. So, yeah. This is Richard again. Uh, Patrick and Chris are both absolutely right. And I think that it, it, there's definitely a clear correlation still uh, between the, the chunk and segment durations as well, uh, having a multiplier effect on latency, especially if you use an HLS or DASH just because of the buffering requirements that are part of the spec. Um, the quality part of it, I just wanted to add, is obviously twofold. It's not, for, for everyone listening, it's not just the visual quality, but it is. The, the As Patrick said, the more you lower that duration, uh, the less efficient the codec can be with the, with the data that's being encoded. Um, but at the same time, also lowering that has an impact on the ability to be robust across different network conditions. So we're talking about um, stuttering and pausing, rebuffering, not just the visual quality when we when we mention quality. Great. What about um, you know what? So okay, so you know obviously people have been using HLS you know since Apple um, provided it to the, to the industry. Um, it's been adopted by probably you know, every video distributor, but it, it has always been plagued by latency, right? So I think there were, you know, at the beginning, there was probably about 30 seconds of latency. And then, you know, through tweaks and, and manipulations, uh, there are companies that have reduced that latency down, you know, considerably. Um, but now Apple has come out with low latency HLS or, or LHLS. Um, and, you know, maybe, um, maybe Kevin can start us off here and then Patrick can, can jump in as well. But you know, what does this new LHLS really promise in terms of reducing latency? And what does it mean for companies, you know, for video distributors that want to adopt it? Do they have to do something new, different? Um, what, what's, what's this all about? Yeah, so it's, it's actually a pretty radical uh, change to the HLS spec, in, in my opinion. Um, and and the, the underlying premise uh, is we we're going to make the segments really short um, and may, well the segments still say stay, stay the same length they're going to create partial segments which basically turns if you're trying to do low latency and follow this and say you're using 200 millisecond segments or partial segments excuse me um, you're turning HLS into a small object delivery type service um, where if you were using, say, a, a five-second segment or six, you know, those aren't too uncommon these days, uh, you would get two requests every six seconds, one for the stream level manifest and then one for the underlying media segment. So, and then the resulting media segment would be several hundred K to a, byte, a megabyte in size, depending on the band to the bit rate, whatnot. So now, you know, if we're doing partial segments, we're now making a request every 200 milliseconds. Now, at this point, you know, following the spec, it's one that so you're requesting the manifest, and then they're going to push over HTTP2 the partial segment um, associated with that manifest, the current one. So, you know, it's hard to say how we count a request when you're pushing it. Uh, but now you're at least give, doing a manifest request every 200 milliseconds. So instead of one or two requests every six seconds, now you're making, you know, five requests per second for the same stream. And now your partial segments are are much smaller in the kilobyte range. Um, and, you know, so that changes the delivery dynamic quite drastically just from that perspective alone. Now, it likely will will provide for a much lower latency uh, service and so the you know consumers will have to decide 
uh, not consumers and consumers, but the, the consumers of the spec, the content owners will have to decide how critical latency is for them and whether or not, you know, the, the, the cost associated with producing this and distributing it is worth it. Um, I think the other, the other real onerous requirement is the, the support for H2. Uh, most CDNs, well, we might support it at the edge, um, you know, push what this particular use case is not something that's implemented. Most of us don't support H2 up to the origin. We, we take those H2 requests and we deserialize them into multiple H2 to be one requests, and, and that gives us the ability to parallelize uh, and simplify the, the, the routing inside the CDN and up to the origin. And now they're, they're essentially forcing an end-to-end -end H2 uh, system with a push model uh, that's going to take some time to get to adoption, where I think there's some other technologies that probably are a little more readily um, interoperable with the existing platforms. Great. Patrick or, or no, Johan or anybody have any, Fritz, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, Patrick, I can jump in. So, Kevin, you 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 brought some. Uh, indeed, there there are some challenges with uh, this uh, new uh, spec, but there are also uh, uh, something uh, promising, interesting in, in in this. In a way that um, uh, I, I would say, for me, the first thing is that uh, uh, we uh, today we do have the uh, dash with SEMAF using SEMAF chunk delivered using HTTP chunk transfer. And uh, with a new uh, low latency HLS, we can have the same uh, media file, the same CMAF, uh, CMAF segment with CMAF chunk inside, the CMAF chunk being mapped to this part file. So this is for, for the content, uh, for, the, for the creation of the media file, very interesting, uh, at least. For the part of the delivery, that's true that uh, this brings some new challenge of using HTTP2 and push push uh, directives uh, across uh, the CDN, definitely. Yeah, you are, Molina. I think I, I'd like to add a couple of things that is worth spending some more time on studying how, how this will work. Uh, first of all, as Kevin said, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges for, for the CDN series is both the HTTP2, but also the heavy signaling. And the heavy signaling, though, enable one thing that you don't have in in chunk cinema, and that is to change bit rate uh, between the chunks. Uh, still, I think something to to be proven that you need to do that. I don't know if, if you really need to to change your your bit rate uh, with that uh, with, with, with that often. So you need to be able to do it within the chunks or between the chunks. Uh, Another thing that uh, that is a bit challenging with all of these chunks uh, formats is to how to measure the the bandwidth. So I think it will be more difficult for the clients to to find the right bit rate because with these chunk formats and push, uh, it's rather the I mean you if you know how you measure uh, the available bandwidth, you do that by measuring how long time it took to to transport a, a segment of a known size. But when using these low latency flavors of uh, HLS, but also the dash, it's actually less the transport and more the process creating the chunks that, that introduce the latency. So, so you won't be able to measure latency, measure bandwidth uh, in the same way. And then uh, a third thing that we, uh, are struggling with a little bit, especially on the low latency HLS, or, or actually not so much with the low latency dash, but on the low latency HLS side, and that is is uh, to do service side ad insertion, uh, which is increasingly popular, uh, and uh, uh, that is still something to work a bit on how to figure out how that would work uh, with this low latency format. Great. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you guys just talked about a little bit, um, especially, you know, Kevin introduced this, this problem of you know, really kind of protocols, right? So obviously we talk about protocols in delivering, you know, traffic from the network to the end user. And, and that's kind of what I want to concentrate on. But obviously protocols play a big role within the network too. And, you know, I think those can probably 
um, contribute or mitigate latency, you know, when, um, you know, when they're, when they're used um, to their best, to their best effort. But let's talk a little bit about the protocols, you know, that are being used to deliver video out to the end user. And um, maybe Fritz can uh, lead the discussion on this one. But, you know, obviously, there's a number of competing protocols out there right now. So, uh, you know, you've got, um, obviously, HTTP, uh, which is the de facto, and everybody's using that to deliver, you know, HTTP chunk streaming. Uh, but then you've got now, you know, you've got Quick, uh, or HTTP2, you've got uh, SRT, which has become, you know, uh, fairly popular in the industry. You've got WebRTC, um, and I do, I do kind of, you know, find it kind of funny uh, that we had low latency streaming um, way back when, and that was called QuickTime. <laughs> and of course, we went away from that, and now we're, you know, going back to these sort of proprietary protocols. But, you know, Fritz, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? I know that Limelight is, you know, placing a huge bet on WebRTC. Um, but you've got all these other protocols around. What, um, you know, what do people need to consider when thinking about what protocol to use to deliver streaming video? Sure. Yeah. So I can I can definitely speak to to some depth about the WebRTC stuff. But the I think it's it's always going to be somewhat of a trade off between your your latency and your quality of experience. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, specifically with WebRTC, you know, it's an interesting protocol. Uh, and, and sort of a, a subset of protocols buried within it. Uh, it's fairly ubiquitous from a, from a availability standpoint, since uh, it doesn't require much of any kind of custom SDKs or clients. Uh, it's all sort of browser-based built in. Uh, but specific to the protocols themselves, it operates in a manner which has very, very uh, tight buffers. Um, and it, it's sort of inherent to the WebRTC platform itself and the protocols to say, you know, do you want to have larger buffers, therefore sacrificing latency or injecting more latency, or would you rather have lower buffers uh, and deliver something that's closer to, to the atomic uh, viewpoint of whatever is occurring? Uh, we're seeing, I think, the, the industry shift somewhat in the sense of, uh, you know, we're talking about latency, we're on this panel right now talking about latency, but there are, are a, a large portion of, of content origination and producers that say, you know, if I can get down to two seconds or three seconds, whether it's globally converged or whether it's it's scoped to geographic region, I'm good. I'm great with that. I'm fine with that. I, I, if I can get it lower, great, but it's not really my main focus. And then there is this, this sort of emerging, uh, I think, uh, desire in industry to say, I absolutely need sub second. I have to have it below, you know, one second from, from an end to end. Or, you know, if, if you say, if you can give me this frame or this piece of data, this packet, going from the origination point to the end consumer to the device, and you can do that in say one second or 1.2 seconds, that's my sweet spot, that's what I need. And it's these interesting use cases where, um, you know, if, if from, from our perspective, if you look at uh, gambling, for instance, or, or auctions or online sports bettings, there's a, a synchronicity between what you're viewing and what you're hearing, and then what's the input and output of that from an application perspective. So if you're placing a bet for, for for gambling or if you're trying to win some kind of auction, you know, the, the milliseconds there and shaving those milliseconds off actually matter. They really do or they're intrinsic to the product itself. Uh, you know, other cases that we're seeing uh, is uh, the scientific community. Um, one of the things behind the, the WebRTC protocol is that it sort of um, it, 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 it combines the audio and video channel with an actual data channel. So you can do. Uh, some interesting things like time sync and frame sync between uh, the the data that's being presented uh, from an application perspective and the actual audio and video. Uh, for instance, look at some of the platforms like like Twitch or Twitter. When you know you're seeing some kind of video, there's frames that are on the screen, but what is being presented in the data channel to the right, which may be a chat room, doesn't necessarily align with what you're seeing. And so the WebRTC spec and the protocol itself actually helps to facilitate the low latency aspect of that and the synchronization of the three different uh, channels of audio, video, and data. Uh, and it manifests itself in interesting ways. Uh, for, for example, the scientific community that has uh, under underwater uh, uh, submersibles or drones, if you will, uh, where they need to see the feedback as quickly as possible in that sub-second manner, but then they also need to be able to control the submersible through that same data channel. And in order to effectively control that submersible, they have to be guaranteed the, the, the frame and data sync between what they're seeing and what the input controls are. So I think WebRTC gives us that, that interesting space of it, it's reducing the latency inherent to the protocol, 
but it's also sort of adding on this this uh, this this extra sugar on top where you can combine a, a, some interesting workflows and data control points that are either referenced off of the audio video or dependent off of the audio uh, and video streams themselves. In terms of quick and, and HTTP2, I think, and SRT for that matter, they're, they're both, you know, really interesting protocols that are trying to essentially, you know, if, you, if you're looking at quick, it's essentially, you know, can we get the, the efficiency of UDP uh, with the durability and the retries of TCP? Um, I think the things to be considered with SRT and with QUIC is more, in my opinion, more from the standards perspective. You know, what will sort of quote unquote win out in the end? Um, or are we going to continue to see more fragmentation with, you know, additional protocols and additional transit formats that are going to be, you know, pushed out into the ecosystem? Um, what will be interesting is once HTTP3 is ratified. Um, with the IETF because, you know, HTTP3 is essentially taking QUIC and building into IETF spec into the RFC. I think if that, if it reaches ratification point at that, in, at that stage, I think that will sort of be the, the dominant transport and protocol format, given that it's based off of the standards, because it's, you could say we're going to adopt SRT, but, you know, what supports SRT? Do, do the network support it? Do the CDN support it? Do your downstream clients support it? And what's the lift to sort of integrate and bring that into play? You know, it's not maybe not a huge lift if you have your own device, your own platform, but if you're talking about Tizen or Samsung smart TVs or any of the other litany of smart TVs, that could be a considerable lift to get something like SRT in place. But I think the, the overall consideration is, you know, what is going to be more pervasive? And it's a little bit of a crystal ball moment, but that's what I would be really focusing on from uh, from a non-web RTC perspective is what will be the the foundation in the future and which way is it going? Fantastic. Anybody uh, want to jump is, into that? That was, yeah. <laughs> I do. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is Richard again with Streaming Global. I think uh, your point at the beginning, Jason, was was right on. And and uh, the explanation on WebRTC was, I don't think I've heard it said better before. So well done on that. Um, as a longtime engineer, I like to, I'm going to use some jargon, I like to focus on the root cause of problems when I'm trying to uh, debug issues. Sometimes those issues are performance-based, sometimes there are others. Um, but it seems like as an industry, we've had this um, this uh, long time of adding different band-aids to try and solve problems that were either already solved in a different way uh, or um, just added a little bit more elegance to the solution or sometimes at the expense of other features. Uh, that's just that happens all the time in engineering so um, for me i like to always kind of step back and look at the the big picture the big problem and figure out what was the right solution for the actual problem um, in this case being mostly performance uh, and scalability um, for the streaming industry uh, when uh, chris you mentioned uh, that with lhls obviously they're trying to move that more into a design for small object movement or transport. And uh, I, I agree with that. And when we stepped back a couple of years ago, um, gosh, almost three years ago, and decided we're going to make a pipeline for what the internet has become today instead of what it's been through the two and a half decade history with streaming, um, we, we thought about the same thing, which is how we're going to, latency is going to matter more and more how do we improve that? Is it chunk sizes? You know, it's a combination of different things. So we we realize we're going to have to move smaller pieces of data more efficiently. Uh, and when we looked at the existing technology stack for moving small data, we came all the way back to the original HTTP one. Uh, it's actually a great, easily scalable technology for moving small bits of data around. Uh, it starts to get more complicated and requires additional help when it's moving big data around. Um, but originally for what the internet was designed for and for what HTTP was designed for with, you know, text-based stuff and web pages, those sizes are great for, as it turns out, for, for small chunk durations. Um, so we, uh, we found that we were able to eliminate a lot of complexity 
um, by simply removing a lot of the custom protocols that, that seemed like they were adding complexity, not just for the, the source, but also for the, the CDNs and transport steps, uh, as well as the players. Um, we wanted something that was going to be completely cross-platform supported, uh, but at the same time, um, accepted on any network topology and any firewall and, and we kept coming back to just standard HTTP actually works really well for high scale movement of small chunks. Um, we partnered with a hardware accelerated cloud services company called Hellastorm. Uh, and I wanna thank them for inviting me uh, on this call today. Um, but their technology, um, after we had invented this uh, streaming pipeline that was just standard HTTP, direct to cloud storage, we found this other company that had just hardware accelerated cloud services, including cloud storage. They hardware accelerate the, the network processing, the storage processing, the, all of the different pieces that when you're in um, the CDN step of the transport are things that start to add those, those critical milliseconds um, that you just mentioned about WebRTC being important to uh, auctions and the sports wagering and, and other uh, areas that that low latency really matters to uh, as a business. And so by combining our technology and integrating it in with their hardware acceleration, which works on standard um, enterprise servers for, for cloud storage, uh, we found that we've got the efficiency of scale um, and the ultra low latency performance without having to jump through the various protocol hoops that, that continue to come along. Great, great. Well, we've got, um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and so I just wanna remind the audience, if you've got a question, uh, you know, pop in the question box and we'll get that answered for you. But um, what I wanna jump to now is, you know, I guess, one of the things about latency is we can say, oh yeah, we have a latent stream. We have our stream is slower, our viewers are telling us it's 10 seconds behind or 15 seconds behind or whatever. But you know, what that comes down to is sort of how do you measure it, right? How do you measure latency throughout the entire workflow? And um, if I can start with Chris on this, you know, what are some of the ways that uh, a video distributor or an operator or somebody can measure the latency from potentially glass to glass and then maybe even, you know, if you have some off the top of your head, what are some of those KPIs, um, you know, that, that video distributors should really be paying attention to? Yeah, I think the, uh, I think I kind of like to talk about it in reverse order, which is talk about the KPIs first and which ones are the most relevant. Um, so in measuring that, you know, is it time to first bite, is it download time? And and, and as we think about it, especially as we're, we're operating to a large audience is, what is our what is our quality, right? Um, is is latency the only measure, or should it be one of many measures? And, and bit rate, and we've kind of talked about these things before, but uh, bit rate stability, um, ensuring that 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 you've got a robust experience, um, and of course latency can can fill into that. But uh, I actually don't don't know that I've got the perfect mix of KPIs for anybody. And I think it's gonna be different for every use case. Um, like they were talking about gaming earlier or, or the scientific application, you know, that, that latency is more important. Um, however, when you know we're looking for a lean back experience for somebody to watch TV on a big screen, the quality is, is probably more important. So um, do I have an answer for that exactly? No, but <laughs> I, th I think we need to pay attention to all of those things um, in that balance. Um, so, and, and kind of to that point, I would say that, that when we're talking about stream, you know, I'll, I'll make the statement, the stream, stream performance and latency don't necessarily have to be directly related. So that stream can be performant, can be robust and of good quality. Um, and in some cases, maybe a little more latent than, than its neighbor, but uh, might be a better experience overall. So to us, I think that's that, that's the most important thing, uh, but I'm not saying that's gonna be the most important to everybody. That makes uh, sense, anyone else have anything to add? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, that's right. 
But I was just, my, my only other thought was kind of the same thing I had mentioned before, which is, you know, looking at the whole, the, the whole and the, you know, what part goes into transcoding. And I think one of the things we've not really spoken to too much today has been the client side of things. Um, and what a decoder expects and, and how it gets fed and how it maintains that, that, that presence to the user. Uh, I think we need to pay attention to that as an industry. Can I jump in there before, before we move on to the, the new topic with the, uh, the player side? I just want to say, I think Chris is right on on the different things that can be measured and should be measured. Uh, and, and Jason, your question specifically about how do we measure? Um, that's definitely been a, a critically important part of our development and our path to get to reliable sub-second latency at scale. Um, early on, we realized we can't just, you know, have a live stream and start a stopwatch every time somebody raises their hand up and use that as a reliable measure when we're getting into milliseconds of difference. Uh, so we, again, uh, engineering parlance here, right tool for the right job. The We use a standard MP4 container, ISO BMFF. Um, as you mentioned, QuickTime, you know, that was the early days of MP4 and, and that worked great as live streaming. So the standard itself has actually got a lot of neat features built right into that container for customization, um, as well as if used properly, synchronization. So we uh, embedded, started embedding custom boxes into the MP4 container because we control the packaging at the source, we're able to put a timestamp in right at the encoder. Um, by doing that, we now have something to compare to all the way through the delivery pipeline to potentially the player. If it's a custom player, it doesn't have to be. Um, and at that point, we can give, you know, ticks, even sub millisecond uh, performance measurement on every step of the delivery latency. Uh, so from glass to glass, there's a lot of steps, we can actually give a display on every one of those. Uh, but primarily the, the important one that most people care about is, well, what is, what is glass to glass? From the moment of capture to the moment it's being displayed on the viewer's screen. And we just did that using, you know, built-in tools in the, the MP4 ISO BMFF spec. Uh, in our last test, yeah, we sorry. actually did a public uh, I'll just finish this one sentence. In our last test, we did a, a public demo, um, again, integrated with uh, Hellastorm, which was hardware accelerating uh, a Dell, I think, 640 or 740 server. And uh, we did a mobile-to-mobile -mobile stream in front of a live audience uh, on a public Wi-Fi network uh, to a data center that was in another town and back. And it came in using our measurement. It was on the giant screen behind us. It was at about 600 milliseconds, uh, glass to glass. And and we wouldn't have been able to measure at that level of speed. Uh, so having the ability to to put instrumentation right into the content uh, and being able to synchronize at that point becomes possible because of the because of the measurement. We can make dynamic adjustments to to playback if you adjust the player. Uh, to be able to synchronize all of the viewers to to those same milliseconds. Sorry about that. I'll I'll wrap. wrap yeah. Up. So that was. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I, I just wanted to call out uh, that within I mentioned at the beginning of the call that we're working on a white paper within the SBA and the live streaming working group. We actually have have provided some guidance on how to do that in a standards way using kind of industry defined mechanisms rather than proprietary methods, but same concepts, being able to embed times within the stream in a, in a well-defined box uh, that everybody can access and understand and measure and establish kind of interoperability along those points uh, within the stream. So a lot of parallels there. Um, hopefully we'll be getting that white paper out here soon. And a lot of, a lot of other good information in there, particularly topics on player uh, latency and different technologies that are available. So, uh, you know, have a read when it comes out, and it'll certainly provide a little bit more insight on this topic as well. Absolutely. Fantastic. All right, guys. So we've got uh, got a couple minutes left, and I kind of wanted to get to this last question, you know, a little bit about the future, right? So, um, you know, let's do this. Let's kind of just go down the line. We'll start with, um, we'll start with Kevin, 
uh, you know, and we'll, uh, we'll end with, uh, with Richard, but, you know, if you can take like 30 seconds or, or even shorter and where do you and answer the question sort of, where do you think latency is going to be in two years time, right? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be better, uh, worse, you know, and, and then the, the sort of subsequent question is, can streaming latency ever come close to, uh, you know, to traditional broadcast over qualm? So, uh, Kevin, give it a start. Yeah, so I, I expect a large majority of, of content will continue to be delivered at the latency levels that we see today, uh, primarily just because the workflows are established, it's very cost efficient, and it provides a, a tremendous quality experience. Um, I think there's going to be uh, less live content in general over time, and what live content does exist will probably be more event-driven, uh, and there will be a desire to have lower latency on the order of broadcast, so you have a common experience across the platforms. Um, and I think that can be had pretty easily with the technologies that we have available to us today and, and some tweaks on the player side. Um, there's going to be a niche in my opinion, of, of ultra low latency services, uh, but I don't, I don't foresee or expect them to be a dominant factor within the distribution chain because of the additional complexity and cost and the quality trade-offs that they'll likely bring uh, for the foreseeable future. All right, Chris. Uh, yeah, I, I think things will get better, but I think they'll get better using the tools we have today. So I mean, we talked about smaller segment sizes and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, one of the questions we, I don't know if we exactly got to, but we, we considered was hardware acceleration and if that can help. And uh, certainly in, in, in a transcode um, portion, um, you, you know, the, Patrick was talking about the, the, the balance between uh, latency versus quality and stuff like that. With hardware acceleration, we can kind of cheat a little bit um, and reduce some of that time, if not eliminate, but not necessarily eliminate it. So I think through those choices, through some of the tools we have, it'll get better. Um, but I think also the definition, and I think this is kind of what Kevin was trying to say, the definition of what broadcast is, I think, kind of changes over time as well. Um, so I, I, the, the fact that you said specifically our traditional QAM broadcast, uh, I think even that changes a little bit um, w over time. So I think they'll get closer together. And I think to me, that this, if, if I had to say one thing in this topic, uh, I think to me that's almost more important than actually what the true glass-to-glass -glass latency is, is, is the deviation between a broadcast or a traditional experience and a, an IP, uh, especially ABR type experiences. If we can bring those closer together, um, to me that that's that's a more useful goal than just purely measuring and getting a target duration or, or latency. Great, Johan. Yeah, no, I. I definitely think uh, that the latency uh, in general in those applications where latency is relevant uh, will go down, even just using the protocols and technologies we have today. So if you compare the Olympics next year with, uh, with the World Cup last year, just by tuning and optimizing some encoding, uh, packaging, and, and buffer settings in clients, you, you easily get down to between six and 10 seconds, which is pretty close to what you have on IPTV solutions and so on. So, so uh, I think it will go down drastically in general, uh, but maybe not thanks to uh, innovative or advanced new protocols, more due to simple optimization. Uh, then there will be some services where latency is really super critical, where you might uh, adopt uh, these new technologies or new protocols to get down to, to a second or maybe even sub-second. I think as a kind of, uh, as an interesting context for this discussion is that we, uh, I had a chat with a, a sports service uh, that do OTT streaming of sports a couple of weeks ago and uh, they explained that for them latency wasn't an issue anymore because they simply bought 100% of the rights in the market and they only delivered that via streaming. And suddenly all references from broadcast was gone because yeah, the only way to see it was via streaming. 
So I think that's also a, a aspect here that the, the the kind of the, the struggle to get on par with uh, with cable or uh, or terrestrial uh, broadcast is just an issue if you have those references, uh, which you might not always have. So that was sure. it. Oh, great, Patrick. Yeah, okay, so uh, having a latency for OTT on par with broadcast, we, we have demonstrated today that this is possible definitely with uh, either by tuning the existing uh, uh, workflow or um, easier, I would say, by introducing those new schema flow latency protocols. Uh, so this is possible today. Uh, can, can, can we beat the broadcast, I would say, be better? Uh, yes, that could be possible on, on good networks, but then there is a, there is a, a new case, question that comes because our customer will then ask, okay, can you do something on the broadcast side? Because now this is the broadcast which is behind the, the OTT. So uh, the, I believe we will have to be very careful in uh, how far we want to go uh, for in this direction. Uh, to conclude, I, I would say that Probably uh, the main challenge in the coming years will be for sure to uh, to, uh, to uh, introduce those new low latency service, but uh, to introduce and to make them uh, with the latency on par with broadcast, but at scale. I mean, with uh, millions of subscribers, and this is another story uh, more than just having a demo with a few 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 clients connected to uh, to the service. So this is a, a big challenge for, for the coming years. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'm sorry, Fred, Richard, I don't get to hear your answers, but uh, we are completely out of time. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. You guys were fantastic today. Really uh, valuable information, very useful information that I think uh, our attendees can, you know, take to their jobs and figure out how to reduce latency, um, you know, and then obviously building for the future, right, figuring out what's going to come next and how do I uh, judge and evaluate that and, and figure out how it fits into uh, my overall, um, you know, video distribution strategy. So again, thanks everybody for attending and uh, sticking with us. I uh, we'll hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and this will be posted uh, hopefully later today. Uh, everyone take care and have a wonderful rest of your day. Cheers, Great. Bye. Thanks, JT. Thank you. Bye.